Hey guys and welcome. Today I'm going to take you through what a commercial airline flight plan looks like and what we do as pilots and what we look through before the flights. Uh, now for my airline we have Lido flight plans. Now Lido flight plans are made by Lufthansa Group, by Lufthansa Systems and uh, they're very good. Uh, at least I like them but I am a bit biased towards them as I use them every day of course. Uh, but they are very clever and I'll talk about a few things about them as I go through them. I'll try and make this brief so it doesn't get too boring, I hope. So this is the first page of our flight plan, ATC flight plan we see there. And this is just a summary of the flight plan. We have a couple of few things I've blanked out there, company, registrations, flight plan numbers, etc. But you can see the basics. So we have the aircraft we're going to be using, uh, the departure and arrival aerodromes. So Echo Delta, Delta Papa, Golf Sierra Sierra. Uh, and essentially the route. Uh, that is an alternate there for Golf Golf Whiskey. So as you can see here, we have everything from the SID, uh, Olsen 5 November in this case, to Olsen. These bits here were our airways. So this is the Yankee 233, and MBOX will be a point along that airway. So Yankee 233 to MBOX, then we're going from Lima 9, Upper Lima 986 to Powell, etc. All the way down to the arrival Abbott 1 Charlie at Stansted. So this is just a quick summary. Uh, page 2 is the operational flight plan. This is similar to what you have uh, at flight school, except uh, a little more detailed and a little more complex. This is essentially what you have at your flight school, uh, except it's a little more complex and more detailed. Lido does do a lot of the calculations for us, which are very good, especially with the fuel, uh, and it's a very clever system. So uh, at the top here, you'd have uh, your company, the date, the departure and destination, aircraft and registration, uh, the release date for the flight plan, which doesn't always coincide with the date of the flight, so something to make note of. Again, the departure and destination names and codes. You can see here the IATA and uh, ICAO codes. And the estimated time of uh, off-blocks departure, off-blocks takeoff, landing and on-blocks there. And these are calculated uh, based on past experience and uh, even the time of day of the airfield. It's a really very clever system. It knows how busy the, the airport's going to be, etc. Our aircraft model, the engines that are on the 737 that everybody knows about, uh, the fleet category, that's based on the maximum takeoff weight. This is for performance reasons. We have various uh, fleets within the same type of aircraft. Uh, down here, we have the maximum takeoff weight, landing weight, and zero fuel weight of the aircraft. And then the estimated, this is something the, the flight plan provides for us, so we can uh, make an estimate of what we're gonna be taking off at, what our takeoff weight's gonna be, what our zero fuel weight's gonna be, etc. Uh, these are things that get popped into the FMC. Uh, along the right here, we have a lot of information that goes into the FMC as well. Uh, so the cost index, uh, six in this case, and uh, the ground distance and air distance that the flight plan's calculated, uh, the top of climb wind, uh, I'll explain a bit more about that in a second, the average wind along the route, which all go into the FMC, top of climb ISA, that also goes into the FMC, uh, and a few fuel calculations there. Um, below here, we have the flight level steps. So what this means is uh, it's calculated for us essentially a step climb based on the best, most fuel efficient way to fly this flight plan depending on the winds, etc. So it really is very clever. Uh, in this case, for example, it has us uh, cruising at 280 initially to Povel and then a climb up to 360 to Delta Lima Echo and there's a little gap there and then eventually a climb up to 380 at uh, Reckon. This may not be the case, because normally ATC might do straight up to 360 or 38, whichever you decide based on your weight. Uh, there, may, there can be quite a distance between uh, these two points here, because this may be down to a fuel burn, and then eventually you can get up to a higher altitude once you've burned a little fuel. Uh, but the important thing to note here is that the top of climb wind from over here it coincides with the first step climb. So uh, when I'm programming the FMC, I know I'm going to be cruising at 36. Uh, so I will look up the wind for 360 and pop it in and disregard this wind here. Uh, a little further down here, we have a whole bunch of fuel calculations. So this is something Lido does for us, which is great. So we have the planned fuel. This you may recognize from ATPL. So you can see we have all the different types of fuel that we legally require to take on board. So we have a uh, trip fuel. I'm just going to round up because is what we do and it keeps it simple. So that would be 3.7. So 3.7 times is what we require for the trip and the time uh, of the flight, one hour, 28 minutes. Uh, minimum contingency, as you know, there's like a 5% minimum contingency that uh, we require to take. So that's your five minutes there and it equates to uh, 200 kilos. Uh, alternate, so that's fuel to the alternate, in this case, Luton. Now it doesn't necessarily need to be Luton, we can change this, of course, 
um, but this is just what the flight plan has decided that our alternate's going to be. Uh, 1.2 tonnes, and it's going to take 26 minutes to get there. Uh, our final reserve fuel, again, something we all need to take, as you'll remember from ATPL, 30 minutes, cruising at, I think it's 1500 if I remember rightly, above the ground, uh, with one engine in op. Anything added onto reserve fuel there, in this case it's saying zero. You may find sometimes you get added fuel there for weather or, or any, any additional reserve fuel that the uh, flight plan decides that we need. So it calculates the total up here, 6.1 tonnes, and we have two hours and a half basically of flight time on board. Now operating fuel, this is, so it's adding in 72 kilos, two minutes of fuel, and that is based on experience from Lido, from past experience basically. So uh, it could be just the time of uh, arrival at our destination airport, could be busy and just it knows from past experience that aircraft are gonna need a couple more when it's fuel for taxiing or it could be all sorts. It's a really very clever system. So take of fuel, that's what the total is there. Taxi fuel, again, this is based on the, the experience. Uh, so let's pop that in, 15 minutes worth of taxi there. And that will give us a total block fuel, 6.4. Uh, we normally round up plus 100, so that'd be 6.5. And that would be what we'd ask the fueler to fit in. Now, of course, we can ask for extra fuel. There's no problem in our airline to ask for extra fuel as long as there's a valid reason. But if the weather's good, basically, Lido does a superb job of counting the fuel that we need and adding any contingencies that we do need. Uh, if the weather's bad, you never really know what you're going to come across. So that's when we would decide maybe take an extra 600 kilos or an extra you know, 10, 15 minutes flight time uh, in case uh, of a go around if, if there's bad weather at the destination or anything like that. Uh, and then for the FMC info, so this gets popped into the FMC as well. Our reserves would be 2.3, trip and taxi there, 3.9, and that gets popped in. Uh, the reserves are useful tonight because this is when we would have to declare minimum fuel. Uh, if it ever arose to that situation. Minimum fuel you declare if with an ATC instruction, if any diversion from that last instruction, you will be eating into your reserve fuel, then you have to declare minimum fuel. But as you can see, just under an hour's worth of uh, flying time. So it's nowhere near Mayday situation. Uh, a Mayday would be declared if we're gonna land uh, below that. No tankering recommended. Sometimes Lido will recommend us a tankering. Again, depending on the time of year, especially if it's winter, we may decide not to do that because we're landing with too much fuel and we could have ice on the wings, etc. Uh, but it's normally based on uh, fuel prices at the destination, maybe more than at departure aerodrome. Uh, it's all basically to save money. So it's a really very clever system. Uh, on the next page, uh, so at the top here, we have a uh, sheet which uh, both crew have to sign, two or three crew, depending how many crew are on the aircraft. Uh, so you can see there, just crew code, and we sign uh, We sign it to, to just acknowledge that we've read everything, we've read the weather, and we've checked the NOTAMs, and uh, we've checked everything, basically, we acknowledge and sign it with that, and then that gets kept as a record. Uh, below that, we have the alternate list. Uh, you can see there, it gave Luton in the previous page, uh, and that's the fuel figure that coincided that we got from the previous page. So C1. There would be the preferred destination, and uh, the lower the number, the preferred, the more preferred the destination is, and this will be a company preferred destination. So you can see here two and three are missing. Uh, that's either because Lido has decided that they are not suitable, maybe due to weather or they, they may be closed. You know, Lido reads all the notes and things as well, so it knows what's going on, or maybe it's below minimums and it's decided that it's not useful. So the next would be C4, then C7, and then C8. Of course, if we decided that, we can decide that C1 is not a good alternate for whatever reason. Uh, so the next one would be C4, we could check with the company and add any alternate that we decide in there as well. If we do want to add an alternate that's not here, we need to call up and get that changed in the flight plan, but it's not a big issue either. Uh, sometimes Lido can decide that an airfield is not acceptable uh, due to weather, but maybe it's read the weather from a while ago, or maybe it's not managed to read the weather, and now we've decided that it's okay for a suitable alternate, so we can add that in. And as you can see over here, so let's say we were going to Luton, uh, it gives us a quick route to Luton, nice and easy to follow, a flight plan to go at, uh, the minimum route altitude uh, along that route, so nice and low there, the time to the route and the fuel required to get there. So very useful information. Uh, following down, uh, any mail items on the aircraft, so in this case there's none. Uh, if we had any problems with the aircraft, they'd pop up there. And then this, the routing, uh, so this is the page I use to pop the routing into the FM6. So you can see there you've got what wrong where you're expected to depart from. Again, it might not be correct, depending, you know, the weather can change and maybe you can switch runways or what have you. The SID, all the route, like we said before, arrival, and arrival into runway 22 from Stansted there. Uh, then this is quite a useful little page as well, operational impacts. This is just telling me essentially, 
if you go 2,000 feet above or 2,000 feet below what your flight planned cruising altitude was from the previous page, the impact is going to have. So 2,000 feet above, in this case, is saying not available because we literally wouldn't be able to climb up to, if you remember from the previous page, it was saying 380 was the top. So it, probably due to weight, we're not going to be able to get up to 40, which would be the next flight plan, 400. And if we stayed at 36, for example, where well, you can see there, we're going to be burning an extra 40, sorry, an extra 84 kilos and going to take an extra minute to get there. And then for every tonne above our planned, you can see that what extra we're going to have to take and uh, the time is going to have the time penalty. So why is that interesting? Well, let's say we take a ton of extra fuel uh, due to bad weather, well, we'd see the operational impact of taking that extra ton on board. So we would actually need to take an extra 33 kilos just to move that extra ton of fuel. Uh, on the next page, uh, this is just an RBSM check that we do. Uh, so again, this is coming into your operational flight plan, just like you do in the flight school, you have to fill it in as you go along. Uh, so we fill this in every hour or so. Uh, and it's all the altimeters, so the captain is a standby and the FO's altimeter. Uh, at the top of climb, we pop in what it's reading. They normally vary a little bit. Uh, of course, if they vary by more than 200, you can't uh, enter into RBSMS space. Well, that's on the ground, I believe, though. Uh, and then every hour after the top of climb, we take extra readings and just double check. We do have a few procedures in place. Uh, if the altimeters vary by, say, 200 feet, well, we would take a, an intermediate position of those two altitudes to fly at uh, and these kind of things. Uh, the next page here, we have somewhere to copy the departure ATIS and the clearance. And we have to copy these by law, of course. They need to be acknowledged that they've written down, so we would copy them. Uh, again, make sure you always write the time that you've uh, copied and the, uh, the number of the ATIS, the letter. Here is our call sign, although it's blanked out, which is very handy because then when you call ATC, uh, you can tell them you have information Charlie, uh, you are whatever call sign you are, and you can copy your ATC clearance. Now here you will normally be given a squawk code, a cruising altitude maybe, the departure SID, any uh, automatic frequency, handovers, etc. Uh, and then there's a couple of bits here about our flights. So we have uh, the destination elevation, which we pop in to the pressure system on the aircraft, and uh, the alternate elevation also, and the times. So we have here the estimated off blocks, airborne, landed, on blocks, the top flight time on 28, block time, uh, this again, these, we had all these figures on the second page, if you guys remember. And here we put the actual. So this is a summary which we fill out uh, on the go. So we'll do the actual off block, the actual takeoff, landing, on block, top flight time, top block time, just like you guys do in your flight school. This would be for performance. Now we do all this on the OPT now. So uh, we don't tend to fill this out by hand anymore. We use the uh, iPad for that. Yeah, that. Uh, next page is the arrival ATIS. So this we copy en route once we have the arrival ATIS from the air. Then with this information, of course, we do our landing performance calculations. Now, the flight log, this is uh, something similar to what you guys will use in your flight school. I'll run through it quickly. Uh, there's a wee top line which has a couple of interesting bits of information. The most critical minimum route altitude. So you can see here it's quite low, we can run that up to 3,000 feet. So 3,000 feet along our route is going to keep us safe everywhere. Wind shear, this is quite an important number as well. So a wind shear of six, uh, anything above three, four, uh, we could consider a uh, possibility of turbulence at that point. So this is just giving you the maximums up here. And you can basically say what it gives you here. So I'll run through one line. You can see here you have uh, the route. So that's uh, departure airport, that's the uh, SID. And uh, then you remember Yankee uh, 233 from the flight plan route down here. And it also gives you the FIR boundaries, which is very useful. So you know when you're going to expect the frequency change, etc. So I'll run through one block over here. And basically it gives you one line for every point along that flight plan that we popped in before. Let's say, let's take MBOX here, for example. So we have MBOX. It's along the Yankee 233 route. Uh, it gives you the coordinates for the point there latitude and longitude. This little time here is important and that's the total elapsed time for the flight. So what we would do from the top, uh, we would pop in the actual takeoff time up here and add in estimated time to that next point and add all the times up initially to find out what our total flight time is gonna be. So we would add two, uh, then four, then another two, and this is the running total just below it. So you can see there, two plus four is six, Six plus two is eight, etc. if that makes sense. And uh, down here, that's the total elapsed time, 11 minutes. Uh, it said zero minutes from the previous point, so from that top of climb 
to mbox is going to be zero minutes. So basically our top of climb is mbox. Here we have the estimated flight level at the top of climb. Remember we had a step climb here. So we had the first step climb was at 280. Then uh, the minimum on route altitude, 26,000 feet. And the distance to that next point is also there. Next important bit of information, uh, estimated speeds. Now we have from the Mac to the TAS to the ground speed there. Uh, wind component, this again is very important. So this is where I would check if I want to put in 360 as my top of climb wind in the FMC, this is where I get it from, 30677 instead of 30786. The component, so in this case minus 84, so we're going to have a tailwind of 84, which is good. And the shear value in this case is going to be zero. You can see down here the shear value increases a little bit. Uh, this is the outside temperature, estimated outside temperature, so minus 42. Deviation from ISA, so minus one. Here we have the estimated fuel on board and for well, the estimated fuel burn. And down here, we fill out what actually happened. So we're filling out the times, fill out the estimated time of arrival down here. And then above it, we would put the actual time of arrival when we get to that point. And then along here, we would put the actual fuel on board at that point and then calculate a fuel burn from our takeoff fuel, which we noted as we took off. Uh, and then we compare them to the estimated. Of course, if we have big differences, then we can start to figure out why there's a big difference. Uh, we don't do this, of course, every minute or every zero minutes. Uh, we would normally do it at the top of climb, definitely, uh, at the top of descent. And I tend to do every half an hour in between. We also write down any frequency changes and any ATC instructions along the side here to keep us safe. So as you can see here, we just have two or three pages of this. And it's all our points along our route, all the way down to our top of descent. We mark that there as well. And uh, down here, it will give us our estimated fuel on board when we land. That stands that is estimating at 2.6 tons. Uh, it's quite a useful figure to know as well before we take off what our estimated landing figure is going to be. Here on the next page, we have a whole bunch of wind information. And uh, so as you can see, it's just a whole bunch of wind at various altitudes at these various points along our route. We can use this to decide whether we want to go up or down, but Lido has basically done all that for us. So it knows this table and it knows where we're going to get a better fuel burn, where we're going to get a better time. Uh, to our destination etc. Uh, important winds for the FMC that we put in manually are the descent winds uh, to give it an idea of the descent uh, into the FMC so we program all these in there from about 310 down. Uh, next page is the weather. So that is the operational flight plan and now we're moving on to different things. We've got weather, no times, company no times. I'm going to run through this quickly. As you're used to with your flight school we have things like SIGMETs. I'll do another video if you guys want on uh, how to decode METARs and SIGMEX, uh, but I'll go through one quickly just now. So you can see there, uh, that's the date and time, the wind, visibility, clouds, few scattered, broken, temperature and uh, dew point, Q and H, and there's a tempo there on that day, gusting uh, 260, knots, gusting 25, and then that would be the TAF. So that is from the 10th to the 11th from uh, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m and that's the estimated wind visibility and cloud cover for that whole 24 hour period. Uh, you can obviously have more detailed ones with more broken tempos, becoming, all this kind of thing. So that's the weather. Weather-wise, we also have some uh, very cool uh, color charts that I printed off for you here. I tend to look at these on my iPad because they're much nicer. Uh, so you can see we have a uh, wind chart and you can see that it's plotted our route and we can see the wind there at various altitudes. In this case, it's talking about flight level 380 along our route. So you can see we get a whole bunch of these for various flight levels, etc. Uh, then we have the significant weather chart, very important as well. So you can see that's our little route there. And you can see we're crossing over a couple of jet streams, which would probably coincide with the wind shear warnings that we had before. And wind shear doesn't necessarily mean turbulence, but it's a caution that there may be turbulence. All wind shear means is a change in wind direction. Uh, from one altitude to another. doesn't necessarily indicate turbulence. Uh, again, if you guys want me to do a detailed video on how to read these charts, I will do. Uh, but you can see we have um, you know, reports of icing and turbulence in these kind of areas here. Also, this whole bit of weather here, you can see the arrows pointing to this one over here. Uh, so this is saying that we have you know, almost severe icing between the ground and 160 and uh, moderate turbulence between the ground and 160 as well and all that sort of area. So just something to bear in mind. Then we also have uh, essentially what a weather chart, which you might get from the telly. Uh, so you can see that the fronts moving in, we have a cold front, warm front there. Uh, you can see the pressure bars, high, high, low. So you can kind of get your idea, obviously, down there. The weather is forming uh, 
all the weather where the fronts are essentially. And you can see there the Lufthansa system. Uh, this is where we get our information from. Next up are the NOTAMs. Now, apart from the weather, we always need to check the NOTAMs from the airports, of course. So, uh, I won't go into this in too much detail, but again, let's check out Berlin so we can see any information we need to know about Berlin. Uh, and little bits are highlighted in bold uh, to help us pick out bits that we need. So we would read all over this. Uh, the obstacle clearance height or obstacle clearance altitude has been raised as follows. And this is valid from the 2nd of November to the 31st of January. So it's actually still valid today. Um, and you can see the localizer for runway 25 right, aircraft category alpha to delta, uh, and the new obstacle clearance height is 540 feet. There's an interesting one there here. So ILS for runway 26 is out of service and the village for that. Uh, there's even an aerodrome closed. We need to check the dates for that. There's all sorts of things that we need to check. We also have company NOTAMs. Uh, these are made by the company for us and they have any additional information on the uh, airfields that may be relevant to our company, uh, handling frequencies, that kind of thing. And it all has all the dates that our manual should be valid till um, and all these kind of things. This is a, a SAFRA inspection list. And you guys can look up what SAFRA inspection is if you want. Um, so you can see here, we have all sorts of uh, warnings. But let me find an interesting one. So uh, there we go. For example, this would be useful for us. So we can see that our handling agent at Stansted for us. Uh, we have a handling agent, Swiss port, our engineering at, uh, at Stansted as well. And frequencies for them to call them. And that, guys, is it. So I hope you guys have found this video a little bit interesting. All the best. Till next time.